I think we can uh, then uh, get started. Uh, so, uh, so this is an experiment. It's the first time I'm suggesting this format for a course. So let's see how it how it goes. So and the uh, the main idea is to have fun reviewing eight uh, seminal papers. That uh, <coughs> first of all are very important papers that almost everyone heard about and knows they exist, but never had time to sit and have a look. So it's it's good. It's a good excuse. It's also a very good exercise to uh, to review quantum field theory. The main goal of uh, of uh, studying quantum field theory is so that we have the right language for studying papers. And so it's great we study these very important seminal papers and use it to see what are our weak spots in quantum field theory, so that we can brush up on those and improve and uh, develop more quantum field theory uh, uh, intuition. These are not recent papers, as you see, the most recent one is 2003 or something. So, and that's on purpose. It's meant to be a review of really important papers that stood the passage of time. And, um, and so, uh, if you have suggestions for other papers that we could cover in the second edition of this course next year, let me know while we go through this paper. You might say, oh, we could have done this or that or that, and we could do it. Also, if it goes well, we could maybe organize one or two extra lectures to do one or two more papers if we find awesome papers along the way that we would really like to review. There are two things we have to discuss that I suggest we discuss at the end of the lecture. One is the schedule. Where is Leandro? Leandro uh, would like us to switch one of the classes. I would like to ask that on Friday we start a little bit earlier, at least this Friday, so we can discuss this at the end. And we should also discuss uh, uh, grading. How are we going to do the grades for the exam? I have two ideas, but we can also discuss at the end when we are more tired. But now, while we are fresh, we could start with the physics. So, so that's it. So, again, one more thing. The, even though we are going to discuss the grading and the format of the course at the end, in basic, the basic lines of the course is the first day of the week, or the first lecture of the week, we discuss the paper. The second lecture of the week, we discuss recent papers that refer to that paper. So that we discuss a little bit the impact that 50 years later or 40 years later, the paper is still having on some related things and more modern things. Okay? So that's the, the general structure. And I think you should read the paper before the class. I think. So did everyone have a look at the paper uh, before? OK. So if not, you will suffer a little bit. And you can uh, review it for next time. Most of these papers are all very much independent from each other. So for example, the very first two use Feynman diagrams and propagate us a lot. So if you don't know quantum field theory and you don't know basics of scattering amplitudes, you will struggle in the first two. Then the third one is about black holes, that's nothing to do. So then if you struggle in the first two, it doesn't mean anything for the third one, and so on. OK, so let's recap a couple of the main messages of the paper. And there are still two copies, if someone wants. Um, so one message is the following, is that suppose we start with a process that we want to study, where we have some scattering process. And then uh, we ask what is the corresponding amplitude for this process squared. Right? So we compute some rate. So I remind you that we compute an amplitude and we square to extract some kind of rate for this process squared. And this process, we could have lots of exchanges of gravitons or photons between these legs where these exchanges would be soft. In other words, there will be some very small momentum being exchanged. And by soft here, we mean that the energy of these photons would be bigger than some infrared cutoff lambda, the minimum energy of these photons that would be exchanged, and smaller 
than some arbitrary scale lambda. This arbitrary scale doesn't matter. It would be the typical mass scale of this process. It's not important, but we could take And so we ask for this gamma, for this process, and what we would conclude is that this gamma becomes proportional to lambda over capital lambda to some number a that's positive. Now, let me emphasize one more thing in perturbation theory. A is infinitesimal. Okay? So what does it mean? It means that in perturbation theory, when I write 1 over lambda to the power a, I mean 1 plus a times this log, plus a squared times this log squared, plus a cube times the log of this cube, etc. Right? So in perturbation theory, we see a series in a, and each turn is dressed by a log, and that log explodes, because lambda goes to zero. And so we call that an infrared divergence. But there's nothing diverging here. You see that this factor goes to zero. But in perturbation theory, again, this is 1 plus a times infinity, plus a squared over 2 times infinity squared, plus a cube over 3 times infinity cube, etc., etc., etc. But we have to resum everything, and when we resum everything, we get infrared cutoff over an upper scale of what we call infrared. After that, it's no longer an infrared photon. And this ratio goes to zero when we send the infrared cutoff to zero. Now, in an experiment, that's not what we measure. So let's call this. That's not what we measure. Because we could also observe in the final state a bunch of very soft photons a bunch of very soft photons that they are so soft that we cannot detect them photons or gravitons this would also be a possible final state and it would be indistinguishable from this one with three particles because having three particles or having three particles plus four super super soft gravitons is the same thing right? And here, we could put some cutoff. We could say, let the energy of these very soft photons be smaller than some energy E and bigger than the cutoff lambda. Otherwise, we would detect them. If they were bigger than E, E is like the resolution of my detector, then I would detect them. So if I see, if I have my experiment, I get three particles plus a bunch of soft gravitons. Unless their energy is big, then I can detect them. Then they make things in my detectors. And when I do this, this effect, can you read this color? Is this color visible in the video? Let's check. It seems like it's visible, but not as visible. So let me not write formulas with this. And then this effect now, what we will do is say that I also sum over all this external this external photons or gravitons and this sum over all possible final states gives me a factor energy over lambda to the A So, so I'm just reviewing first the general picture, but the counter is jumping ahead and asking where are these soft photons? Are they close to the end like I do here? Or could they be well inside something happening inside here? Could I, be, could I have soft stuff to worry about here? And the answer is, as we saw in the paper, 
that we don't care about this. This don't produce infrared divergence. Only if you are close to the external state, you produce infrared divergence. And why? Why are there divergences? Because you see that this leg is on shelf. And this leg here, before the, the soft photon, is almost on shell now. Because it's on shell up to losing a little bit of energy. So by momentum conservation, this is almost on shell. And this is almost on shellness that gives an extra divergence. The propagator is almost blowing up. And it's this effect that leads to a divergence. If it was happening here, this would be very off shell, this would be very off shell, and nothing would be divergent and there would be no issue. So everything is happening close to the external legs both the loops and also the emissions. So you guarantee that they're, that they're almost on shell by prescribing what the final momentum are, and if they're very close, then, then only a very low momentum will not be transmitted to you. Oh, let me, uh, let's go there. So if this leg is P, and if this leg emits a very soft photon, Q, then this propagator here has momentum P minus Q and because Q is small and this could be an external guy or it could be an internal one but what matters is that Q is small because it's small this is almost on shell yeah and I'm saying that the other because P is on shell yes yeah, so the, the other external on shell line that, that this photon joins P prime forces what, what this Q has to be so Q is a function of P and P prime no that's not true you would have a loop, you could have any Q, but only small Qs lead to a divergence. You have a loop, right? I mean, when you have a loop, there's nothing fixing what this Q is. There is a loop. You integrate over Q. Right? Yeah. So, the loop is Low momenta are part of the loop, so are high momenta, and low is what produces a divergence. Because now, when this momentum is low, this is almost on shell. And therefore, there will be a divergence as we will see. So, let, let, so then the basic picture here is that now this sum over phase space gives a factor like this. And now this factor goes to infinity as lambda goes to zero. Now we would see it as a divergence, even if I consider a three-level process, there's no divergence, and then just summing over this final stuff in perturbation theory would start producing a divergence. A log, A squared log squared, but now it's a true divergence. It resums into something that does explode when lambda goes to zero. But you see that the beauty is that of course lambda cancels when we take both into account. And what we get is that there is, if we, be, if we are careful, there is some extra universal part that we will describe that depends on energy, but this part doesn't blow up. And then there is the gamma for all the hard part of the process, which means you drop all the weakly lines there. Drop all photon lines and so on, and consider just the naive part where this process there's no infrared divergence at all, so this is fine. And what matters is that this is proportional to E over my cutoff scale, again some typical mass scale of the problem, to the A, and this is fine. And now when the energy goes to zero, I get a vanishing result, but this now is a physical, a physical result. And uh, it's what it is. Okay? And so this would be now the amount of a gravitational or electromagnetic radiation soft stuff coming from a given hard process. So you have a given hard process and it sources some soft stuff and that soft stuff comes with this characteristic signal. That's the most important part of the result. Okay, now, once we get this result, there are two interesting things to consider. One, if you want, are some conceptual implications of this result. 
we want to interpret this, what does it mean, how do we think of this process, how do we think of this particular thing. In particular, we will see that this A, this constant A, goes to infinity if the velocity of these hard particles goes to the speed of light. And so what does it mean? If you get extra divergence, should we worry? Is this physical? Is this not physical? And it's interesting to see what Weinberg says, etc. And the other thing that's interesting is to consider an application. And then Weinberg says, take the sun. And what's happening in the sun all the time? We have collisions in the sun. What are the important collisions in uh, 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 some, something like the sun? It's two to two collisions. You have a bunch of electrons and protons and often they are colliding in pairs. And so this is full of two to two collisions of some electron bashing against another electron. And there are many of these. And each of them would produce some soft gravitation each time these collisions happen. They could emit some, a little bit of gravitation. And so you could ask how much gravitational radiation comes from all the thermal activity of the sun. So how do you do it? You compute for a 2 to 2 process and you multiply by how many 2 to 2 processes there are. Proportion of the volume of the sun, density of electrons, density of protons, velocity that they are moving relative to each other. You put a bunch of factors and you get an estimate that Weiner computes and you see that it's more or less the power produced by unit time, more or less the same, he says, as Berkeley. Okay? But Berkeley, okay, in 65. Now, with AC, it's probably more. But this one is probably the same. Okay. So this is what, uh, that's the basic overview of what I would like to discuss from this thing. Okay. Please? Yes. This could be both for gravitons or for photons. And what does handling that mean? This is for gravitons. This was done for gravitons. Yeah. We could do both, yeah. So this is just nice because okay, it's gravitational waves coming from the sun. Of course, we observe gravitational waves, but not from these thermal processes. There are also gravitational waves coming from the sun and the planets. Because that's the same type of gravitational waves that we measure when we measure in spiral of black holes. Right? But in this case, this one is much bigger than the gravitational waves by radiation when we have the sun with the planets moving around. So this type of radiation, which is the one we observe for black holes, for the case of the sun and Jupiter, which are the biggest gas, it's much smaller effect than this one that we are going to discuss by a factor of 1,000. Oh, it's cute that this would be the main one According to him. Now, I'm not sure how robust this estimate is, and that's why we're going to see the recent papers to see, I mean, what do people say? Is it totally unrealistic or not to measure this effect, and so on? And that's the kind of things we could discuss on Friday. Okay, so that's the overview, and the main physical messages are all here. So, uh, and now we'll go a little bit into technical details. Well, not technical details. Any questions so far? Yes, sir. If you do not sum over these loops, this virtual part, so this means that uh, the process, what this means, because, because uh, it's tighter, what does it mean? It means it's not a physical process. Is there any? Okay, so here we computed something physical and we got a finite result. It couldn't be better than this, right? 
What if we, we do not add this? Uh, if we do a wrong computation, we get the wrong result. Oh. I'm both emitting and absorbing a soft uh, gravity. But isn't it the same for uh, every process you could ask? Radiation. Why do we radiate? We also absorb radiation, but we emit yeah, but we don't see the soft. Well, we see all the photons, including the soft ones. Why wouldn't we also see the I mean, this is a computation of a rate. What is this rate? It depends on the hard part of the process, that's finite, times energy of the photons up to which you capture over one. This is a physical thing, it's a computation. You could plot and you should see that it grows with e to the a, and then when e is big, some non-perturbative stuff takes over and you don't know. But this part is universal, it's low energy, Rate. So, I don't know. We will, we will do the computation. Okay. Okay, good. So, let's... Uh, let's uh, I'm not going to copy all the formulas of the paper, because we read the paper, but I want to highlight some important uh, passages that uh, we should uh, that we should uh, understand. So the first is when we have the hard process, we one external uh, photon. Just one. And the question is, what happens when I do this? When I dress this by an external part? Now, like we were discussing, when you attach a single one, we have here momentum t, here momentum q, and so here in this leg, momentum p minus q. And this propagator is almost on shell. So when you compute this propagator, it will explode when q goes to zero. Right? And so if you work out what you get is the following. So you can attach this propagator into any of the legs. And then you get here a divergence, which is P momentum of leg N dotted with Q minus some I epsilon, I eta N epsilon, where this eta is plus minus one depending if it's outgoing or ingoing lag. Can you see why there would be a difference if it's ingoing and outgoing from this type of picture here? Of course, if you read, you remember, because if it's, if it's an incoming lag, this is P and this is Q. And so this lag up here is P plus Q. So there is a different sign of, uh, of the two-factor, if it's incoming or outgoing. And so when you expand the propagator, P squared cancels with M squared, and you get this divergence here. And upstairs, you have the coupling of a photon with a particle, with a scalar set, and it will give you the charge of that particle times the momentum of that particle. So that's an index mu for the photon and also some eta and that. Okay. So this is formula 2.3. Now, the second observation is that the, this formula, there is another generalization if it was a graviton. For graviton, What's the formula? It's something 
Now the graviton has two indices, mu and mu. And the analog of the charge is the energy itself. So we would get here P and mu, P and mu, eta n over the same denominator. And this would be formula 2.7. The second important comment is what happens when we have many gravitons. Okay. Let me put in a different color and let me try to write it. Now it looks more complicated because this guy is almost on shell, this guy is almost on shell, and this can happen before or after. I have to sum and so on. And so there is some combinatorics. But the good news is that the effect of putting not one, but now many, is you just put a product here over all the cues that you want, and that's it. Okay? So if you put many photons, you just have one factor per each mu. And that's it. And it's obvious if they are on different legs. But even if they are on the same leg, you sum over permutations and you write the two terms, the two permutations, and there is a nice identity and the outcome is just a product. Okay? So, and this is the discussion, the fact that it's just a discussion, is the discussion in section 2, two. or 2. Okay, now what we do is the following. We know how to attach any number of gravitons, and now we can use these gravitons for both things that we want. We can either glue them, right? join them, take two guys and join them with a propagator, or we can send them outside and contract them with a the corresponding polarization vector. But it's the same thing. We already have the, the interesting part. What's the diagram with extra soft photons? Now we either glue them to make virtual loops or we put them outside contracting with epsilon. But it's the same object that we need to do. Okay? So that's uh, the good news. And that, because it's the same object, that's why there is a chance that they will give the same type of factors. But uh, that's what I mean. That's my question. Uh, what if we have No, it will, because everything factorizes completely, right? What will happen is that you will have some exponential of an effect from virtual times exponential of some effect from physical. And of course, this contains many terms. There is one term, which is virtual Q times physical to the power 5. So these are all there, but it doesn't matter, because they factorize, they exponentiate, and they separate the two effects. Of course, if you are doing eight order perturbation theory, you see them both at the same time. Three, five. And also five, three, and also two, six, okay. and so on. Yeah. Okay. But uh, everything factorizes completely, and we can analyze separately the virtual and the outgoing one. Okay, so now what we do is now we separate, now that we know this product, we can do virtual or we can do physical. Now virtual means that we will take this diagram, this we will take two legs, we already have this factor. And we will have a propagator here. Now, here you see that if this line was Q going here, this would be P minus Q. 
But here you see Q is arriving, so this line is P prime plus Q. This is P prime. Right? So in this factor exchange, there will be a different sign. One like you have minus, one like plus. Okay, things are just products, so they exponentiate. So let's jump directly to formulas 210 to 212 that I'm going to copy here. So we conclude the following. So everything factorizes. We have this fundamental process. That fundamental process that comes from connecting two guys and doing this integration. This object we define as the integral from some lower cutoff to some upper cutoff. Remember this of the momentum of the virtual photon times A of Q. So this picture is what we call this. Okay, we don't give it any name now yet. And this A of Q is the following. Let's write it down. Minus I, some two pi some propagator right, this is the propagator bit of the photon or graviton, in this case photon then there is charge of leg one and charge of the other leg momentum of the first leg dotted with momentum of the second leg remember, there was an index mu but now we are contracting so it becomes the dot product between the two divided by a factor pn dot q minus i epsilon and if this has the minus i epsilon the other guy because q comes with minus q will have plus i epsilon that's also some eta n eta n for ingoing and outgoing and we sum over all possible pairs Okay? And the claim is that because it factorizes and there is just a product. Is that from the sum and from the connection between the two legs? This is just the interaction, it's just the propagator I wrote here. G mu nu over Q squared. Right? Or minus that. And then G mu nu contracts P mu with P nu of the other leg, P mu with P nu, and it gives P dot P. And now because the legs are all independent. The claim is that this object here inside comes with just exponential of this object because it's this object, etc. plus one over n, there's an n factorial from the particle being indistinguishable and we just sum over it so it exponentiates. Okay? And therefore, the full thing, the full thing, which is the absolute value as well, when I take into account the absolute value and the square, the square kills the one half. And the fact that I care about absolute value means that I want to compute the real part of this integral. Okay, good. And now, where is the real part coming from? Well, this factor here, 1 over, when I have 1 over x minus i x, and I remind you that this is principal part of 1 over x plus i pi delta function. And it's not easy to see, it's not hard to see that the part that will give a real part, there is an i here, there is an extra i here, so what you want is the contribution of this delta function. 
which is physical, it means that this photon is basically on shock. Which makes sense, because we saw the divergences when this Q was very small, so it's basically a non shock photon effect. Very nice. So, when we do this integral, this alpha theta doesn't make, I mean, you don't need this upper, uh, this capital lambda, right? I mean, yeah. we know that this is small. So this could be whatever you want, yeah. So, all the upper comes mostly from the. But you need some upper limit, otherwise, you don't know what you are doing. And then this angle is logarithmically divergent, so you better have some logarithm in some dimensional stuff. And so it's good to put some lambda here. But nothing comes from there. You remember, there was a lambda in the formula, but it gives lambda over lambda to some power. But that lambda is not important. If you double that lambda, it gives you a factor of 2 to the a. It's not important. OK. Uh, Okay, so now let's see. We have a delta function, right? So we have here a delta function of q squared. Q squared is what? It's q0 squared plus q squared. So this delta function will basically give me a factor 1 over q0 and then we set q0 to be equal to the absolute value of q. Do you agree? Just because it's q0 minus something, q0 plus something, Jacobian is 1 over q0. And so let's see powers of energy that we have. So in total, this stuff if I write Q as energy, I write Q now as energy, 1 comma unit vector Q, then we see that this stuff becomes 1 over from that Q squared there. Well, that Q squared, no, that, that Q squared is a delta function that gave me this 1 over energy from this vector Q. Then we got 1 over 1 Q here, 1 Q here, 1 over energy squared. And then uh, we have to integrate. And this integral here now becomes uh, E squared DE DQ, right? If we are in uh, triple one dimension. Do you agree? And therefore, we get some extra factor of E squared DE when we integrate. And you see that in total, we get DE over E that we will integrate from lambda to lambda. And this is log of lambda over lambda. Hello. Sorry. Uh, it's a four-dimensional four space. Right? Yeah. It's four dimension. We set Q to be on shell, so we integrate, we get rid of Q0. Now we have three dimensions Q1, Q2, Q3. Q0 is fixed by the on shell delta function. Now you have Q1, Q2, Q3. Q1, Q2, Q3 you write as radius squared times the two scale. Good? And so you see that you get here exactly what we wanted the law that we want times an integral a hat which is an integral now over just the angle q hat of what quantity of this stuff here this stuff where you replace q by this q hat More precisely, Q, you replace this Q by 1 Q. So you factorize the energy part, the energy part produces the log, and then this integral 
produces actually this we call a hat and then this stuff we call a a we call this minus and then the full result is therefore when I compute this lambda over capital lambda to the power of that angular integral Okay, I'm defining this angular integral like this, it turns out to be a positive number. Any question? All we need to do is compute this angular integral if we want. And if you compute this angular integral, just for completeness, we get formula 2.16, just the outcome of integrating this radial, the radial part. And let's write this formula. So let me see what's the final formula. The final formula says that A is minus the sum over N and M, eta N, eta M, charge N, charge M, divided by 8 pi squared and then some function of beta n m where beta n m is the relative velocity between particles n and m which you can compute where let's get some space where this f of beta is the function 1 over beta log of 1 plus beta over 1 minus and this beta, like I said, is the relative velocity between the two particles you can compute and it's sometimes per root 1 minus mn square mm square over pn dot pm squared so it's not a trivial process it's not a trivial quantity it's a function that depends on everything all the details of the hard process what's important is that this quantity is positive defined like this and therefore the final result is lambda over lambda to some function that depends on the hard process and this goes to zero as lambda goes to zero Any question here? Okay. So this is A. Um, for gravitons, there would be a similar expression. What would be the key differences? You can immediately tell. You see, in the end, it's not the charges that would appear, but if it's gravity, it's the masses, mn, mm. And this function f would be different. This function f would be a slightly different function of the relative velocity that you would have to compute. Okay? And that is because this process would also be slightly different. Here, there will be the masses, there will be more factors of p because uh, we have. Uh, the, vert, uh, the propagator now contracts two indices with two indices and uh, it's slightly more complicated but in the end uh, it's very simple. The summing or something that is positive will be this bunch of signs, eta and eta. Is it obvious that A is positive? Uh, yeah, maybe written like this it's not positive, it's not obvious, but it's true. It is positive. It's manifest once uh, yeah, it's probably right, written like this, it's not obvious, but it's a, it's a true statement. So the question is, is this obvious? And the answer is, it's true, but you might, you might need to work a little bit. And the basic idea is you can check that uh, 
the diagonal terms are always bigger than the off-diagonal, and therefore uh, it needs to be one. In the diagonal ones, we'll have a good sign, and, uh, and that's it. OK. Uh, any other questions? So when you said the when the last equals to zero, the input will go to so. so now we have here this formula, right? So now you can see that beta, when the velocity goes to zero, this log goes to zero, this also goes to zero, so this goes to one when the velocity goes to zero. When beta goes to zero, this f goes to one. you will just get some process, some finite uh, limit when beta goes to 1. Okay. Now, what's the main difference now when we do, instead of virtual, when we do real process? When we do real process, the key difference, now we square this guy, right? And so instead of joining this leg with a propagator, now what we would have to do if we have some process and we are exchanging Q okay. and instead of connecting Q directly with the leg with the propagator now we are inserting here we are connecting the lower amplitude with some polarization connecting the upper amplitude with another polarization and we have a polarization sum. So now we'll be dealing with sums of polarization mu with some helicity h and polarization mu with some helicity summing over h and then the propagate some contraction with the amplitude that would have index mu with the amplitude that would have index mu. Now, these sums over polarizations, they generate factors. They generate a factor g mu nu plus stuff that kills momentum. If you remember, if you don't remember, it's a true statement. The sums over polarizations, they almost give back the metric, but they give the metric plus stuff that's orthogonal to the momentum. And because the amplitudes were proportional to the momentum, we don't care about those factors, and in practice it's just another metric that contracts them again, like it was for the propagator. And so the basic punchline is that in the end, because of that, the computation ends up, and moreover, we were putting a photon on shell, even if it was a virtual process. And so all the, it has all the right ingredients to become, and I'm not going to go into the details, that's not important, but we have on-shell from definition, because it's now moving to on-shell things, but here it was also effectively becoming on-shell because we wanted the real part. And we have contraction directly, because the sum over polarization effectively just contracts them, but that was also what we had in the propagator. And so if you work out carefully this integral, you get the following result, and let me now jump uh, to perhaps formula 2.42. Okay. So now we jump to the conclusion. So we already derived this result that we wanted, and now we are. Our goal, remember, is to derive the factor e over lambda to the a. We are not there yet. Now we are in 2.42. So let me write 
Yeah. Sorry? Well, just take outgoing photons and go to polarization. Right, so to construct a, 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 a physical uh, rate out of an amplitude, you need to contract the external particles if they have spin with polarization or spinners or whatever. In this case, they are photons, so with polarization. So we contract, and this gives me polarization with some helicity h. And I square, which means that I, I do the same thing on the top and I sum over which polarization it is. And this sum over polarization effectively gives me a completion rule, a completion of relation that tells me that I can replace it by the metric in practice. Okay, so we are now in 2.42 that I'm going to write. So that 2.42 says the following the rate due to including these physical processes. For some hard process, hard, and Weinberg uses this notation beta alpha, which means it's any process where alpha particles go to some beta particles, but for us it's this white skeleton of the diagram. When my photons have energy W1 up to Wn, so these are the energies of the photons. And the claim is that we get this factor A, the factor A is this quantity here, A, to the power N over N factorial. Notice this factor doesn't depend at all on these energies, it's just a number, it's a process, it's, it's a stuff that depends on the hard process. And then there is the, the, the gamma just for the hard part, where you remove the photons completely. That, of course, doesn't depend on the photons. And then there is some d omega 1 over omega 1, d omega n over omega n. So we should call this the differential for uh, this process. Any question here? And so we see that we get a log divergence for each of the energies, as uh, we were expecting. So let's just uh, see that we can, now we would like to be a little bit more clever. And we want to say that now, I want to integrate the I want to integrate this quantity, so d omega 1 over omega 1, d omega n over omega n. But I want to say that each of these integrals starts at some infrared cutoff lambda and goes to some maximum energy. But it's important to be careful that I don't want the total energy to be E times N. Yeah, that's too much. When I have a million particles, that would be a million times N. I want the sum of this, I want a step function that says that the energy W1 plus Wn is always smaller than E. So if it was not for this step function, everything would factorize and I could sum and just exponentiate. Because of this step function, this is almost trivial to exponentiate, but it doesn't exponentiate trivially because of this. Yeah. So that's just a convenient trick. It's very useful to know how to deal with this exponential, with this step function. So how do we represent the step function? How do we represent the step function? We can say that this is the integral dx. If I were to write exponential of e minus this, it would be a delta function. Right? If I integrate with this. A delta function, the integral of the delta function is the step function, right? Because it gives 0, and then when it passes by the peak, it gives 1. 
So I need to integrate that exponential. And integrating the exponential gives me a factor of 1 over uh, let's write the, exp the exponential let me write it as sine of x times omega 1 and this would be a delta function but I want an integral in e of that so I divide by x Is it clear? I hope it's correct. Um, the x over x, it is x. Okay, good. And um, but then this step function is again holding that to stop the, the bottom stop. Uh, We can, sorry, just a sec. Uh, say again. This step function What's the is just so we compute, we want to compute this gamma, where we sum over final soft, where the maximum energy is fixed. The fact that they are soft is not a step function. The fact that they are soft is this lambda here. It's the lower cutoff. The upper one is just because if they have energy bigger than E, I would be able to tell it in my detector. So E is the minimum my detector doesn't see if you want. This is the cutoff, the higher cutoff. OK, so. So that's the origin of this exponential, and then you can manipulate the exponential and replace it by, this is odd, so you can replace this by sine, and do a, a bunch of manipulations. So let's jump to the final result, uh, two point. Okay, let's jump to, let me just do one more step here. This, you can believe me, that you can write as e to the i x, omega 1 plus i x omega 2 plus etc. So now it's totally factorized. That's great. But then there is x times e that you can write outside as sine of x e over x. So you get an integral over x of sine x e over x times something that is totally uh, factorized. And, and therefore, the final result that we get is just the following. We go to 2.48 saying that gamma for this at smaller or equal than this energy would be equal to energy over lambda to the a that just comes from the a factorials there and this integrals and then there is some b of a and some gamma hard and this b of a is what? This b of a is a simple function which is just 1 over pi integral d sigma sine of sigma over sigma. Sigma is just x after you rescale, but that is scaling with nothing. And then there is something like uh, a integral d omega over omega e to the i omega a minus 1. You see that what was done here was that there was minus 1, so now this when a goes to 0, this is finite, 
So you add and subtract this minus 1 to isolate the divergence in A that you wanted, and then this part now is, uh, is finite. Okay. So this is just a function B of A. This function B of A actually is 1 as A goes to 0, so that factor is totally safe. It has a tail expansion around A equals 0, so it's not a relevant factor for this discussion. This is the relevant in part. The most interesting part is this final result that we should multiply times this factor so that in total we get what we said in the beginning energy over some arbitrary mass scale to the power A some function B that's universal but not very important that starts at 1 times the hard part of the process. And the same thing you could do for gravity. This integral A in that case, Weinberg calls C. Good. So, okay. So now, we are done with the main part. This is by far the most important part. The message, again, is when you have infrared divergences, that means that there are infinitely many final states that are indistinguishable. So the amplitude for each of them better be zero. Otherwise, you could not create a finite probability by adding infinitely many things. Right? So if you have infinitely many indistinguishable final states, the amplitude for each of them better be very small. Otherwise, you would sum and get things that would explode in your face and probability is bigger than one. And so that's exactly what we see. Each process is vanishingly small, but there are infinitely many of them, and therefore we get an opposite factor somewhere here. And when you multiply both, you conclude that what you get is a factor that the correct rate is a factor of energy over lambda. Sorry, not here. Energy over some arbitrary cutoff. Now, um, here, uh, let's just recap that this f of beta was 1 over beta log 1 plus beta over 1 minus beta. And this factor, you see, goes to infinity as beta goes to 1. So very fast particles would have an enhanced problem here, an enhanced log divergence. And so here we could say, well, so the electron, for example, is a charged particle, but it's not massless, so it never reaches one, so we are safe. On the other hand, gauge bosons are masses. And gauge bosons have charge, right? A gauge boson travels at the speed of light and emits other gauge bosons. So we could be very worried that these divergences of gauge bosons emitting other gauge bosons, based on this treatment that we did, we could worry if this is a disaster. Right? And indeed, Weinberg writes things like uh, the elimination of such complicated interlocking infrared divergences, he's referring to non-abelian gauge theories in remark 6, would certainly be an Herculean task and might even not be possible. But we know it is possible, of course. We know infrared divergences cancel in non-abelian gauge theories. It was a theorem proved maybe one or two years after his paper. And this is the, this famous... Uh, I forgot the name. So does someone remember the names? You what? No. Yeah. What's the name again? Okay. Exactly. Exactly what uh, you said. And so indeed, <laughs> it's not true. He even goes on and says, perhaps it would not be too much to suggest that it is the infrared divergence that prohibits the existence of young Mills quantum, blah blah blah. Uh, wrong. <laughs> not true. So, so that's fine, that's good. 
So uh, it's more complicated than this, you need to work much harder. The combinatorics are not as trivial. In the beginning, we said we attach the photon before or after, we just sum over some permutations and we get a trivial product. All that analysis is more complicated, but it's one or two pages in Weinberg's book. Okay. With a more modern treatment, it can be done as well. Conclusion is the same. Um, there is another nice remark that he made concerning. Uh, ah, there is another remark which is what about gravitons? Gravitons again. Now, now this would be a graviton. Gravitons could emit gravitons. And so we could ask do we have a similar problem for gravitons? And the answer is no, and uh, we, we might have some time to discuss, but the basic idea is that for gravitons, you could ask when this explodes, what happens to the remaining sun? And you will see that, for example, here there will be masses. And the resulting sun that you will get would be basically the sum of energy conservation, that the sum of all masses incoming and outgoing is zero. And you would be saved because uh, of mass and energy conservation would say, no, it doesn't diverge. Even though each term diverges, the sum is finite. So I energy and momentum conservation. And so here we will see for gravitons, this is okay by energy momentum conservation. It's okay. So it's good news. The solved, the solved in, in two years for young bills. But I guess it, it, is, is it still a problem for massless QED if electrons work massless? Is that still bad? I think that would be bad. I think that would be a problematic theory. But that's a good thing we could discuss on Friday. As I said in the description of the course, I'm not able or if we will not have time to know all the context about these papers. I mean, this is like knowing all the physics. I don't know. So, good. What exactly is the difference between gluons and gravitons? The difference is that the gluons are very non-abelian. And you need to be very careful about ordering of stuff and so on. And the algebra is much more complicated. And we would not know how to do the algebra for gluons based on this technology. And Weinberg says it's probably too hard to do the algebra. And that's naive, it's possible, and it's fine. Gravitons, it's fine. The algebra that we did, we could apply the particles of spin too. There's nothing wrong with the formulas. We could apply the formulas for gravitons, where this A is B. And we could apply these formulas. And naively, we would see that this explodes. But then, luckily, the sum is finite for gravitons. And so for gravitons, there's no such problem. And uh, the leading term uh, does vanish by energy and momentum conservation. OK. Now, th there is a, a second remark that is quite interesting, which is always very good to have in mind. Which is that you see that here we did a ton of loops, right? We exponentiate the loops. So it's a very, it looks like a very quantum process. But on the other hand, all this stuff is more or less on shell, right? Everything was more or less on shell. Even when we are emitting many gravitons, they are very low energy, so they are very long wavelength processes. So couldn't we compute all this classically? Shouldn't we be able to compute? this rate of loss of radiation just classically, and shouldn't this be classical? And this is something that, if you follow a little bit all these recent people working on amplitudes and the relation between amplitudes and gravitational waves, where you compute a lot of loop amplitudes, but you say that each loop contains a lot of classical stuff. It's like you should think that you have all these loops, but in the loops there is a classical part, where basically things are on the shell, and the quantum part, where things are on the shell. And you could ask, could it be that this is one of those cases? So, and indeed, if you work out the dimensions and you try to put back all the h bars, and you would compute some de, some d lambda de, say, something like this, dimensional, and you want to compute it. For gravity, you would like you get something like uh, G, some product of masses that replaces this product of charges. Then there will be some uh, energy factor, 
we calculated the uh, derivative in E multiplied by E. And, uh, and that's it, basically. And uh, no, no, E, D, E will just extract this A. A. And A, well, it's graviton, so B. And these dimensionless. And so the total unit would be G Newton times mass times mass. Now, G Newton times mass times mass, let's think a little bit. If it was G Newton mass times mass over radius, it would be an energy. Right? So an energy would be H bar omega. But we don't have R. So I need to divide by R, omega divided by R. I need to I divide this. If I'm careful, here it's a loss. H bar C. And so we conclude Ah, okay. Times DE. And DE is D of H bar omega, if I'm converting to a physical thing. And H bar will totally cancel, and this process, the rate, is proportional to the frequency of the gravity emitted without any H bar. So this is really, you could measure this power classically. It's really a classical process, if you want. So if you are careful, there is no H bar. It's a toy example of the general thing that just because you are doing loops, often when you exponentiate things, you are doing classical things, and this is one such example. Okay, let me just jump a bunch of things, and let's just try to conclude with this application. So, this will be something that will happen throughout this course. It will be very, very rare, if not impossible, to cover the full paper. Covering a full paper, it's impossible. So, there will be parts of the paper that will not cover. That's also an option that on Friday we could revisit some of those or not. So, let's consider an application which is to consider a two-to-two -two process so we'll do two-to-two -two. Okay. and we'll do this where this is some process inside the sun So let, let's just recap what you would have to do. So you have to compute, we want to study the gravitational emission, so it's B. And B, so let's quote it here, just to see exactly what you would have to do, to be very explicit. If we are in formula 4.5 of the paper, there's some G Newton over pi, and some sum over incoming or outgoing mass mass over times this function of the relative velocity f n and m where f is slightly more complicated for gravity but it's a simple function y minus beta squared to beta sum square root Okay, and and beta n m is the relative velocity, so it's that square root that we wrote before, one minus m n 
m m over p n dot p n. Just as a cross check, notice that if I put n equal m, this gives m square, this gives p square, which is m square, and this is 1 minus 1, which is 0. So the relative velocity would be 0 for the particle with respect to itself. So this will be the formula. Maybe there's some square missing, actually. Because 1 minus 1 is lost to 0 for 1 minus 1 square. I think there is a square missing, right? Did I forget the square or not? Can someone tell me? Yeah, I forgot. Okay. So now, how would we study this for a 2 to 2 process? We will not be computing relative velocities. We will be parameterizing the momenta for a 2 to 2 process. We will go, say, to the center of mass. And we would say this is P1, this is P2. Right? Then we would, in the center of mass, say that there is a P3 and a P4. And then I would compute beta 1, 2, beta 2, 3, beta 1, 4, all the beta pairs. Right? Notice that beta 1, 2 and beta 3, 4 both are incoming or outgoing. Beta 1, 3 and 1, 4, it involves incoming and outgoing particles. So, uh, but fine, that's what we should do. We should also consider. And in that case, we have to, we just compute with this vector what we get. And then, uh, if you do it, what you conclude is that this vector B becomes approximately equal when we do an angulatinistic limit. That is, the mass of the particle is much bigger than the velocity of the particles. We get 8 g newton over 5 pi. So we just plug all this there. We get mu squared. Mu will be the relative mass. M1, M2 over M1 plus M2. Then there will be velocity of these particles to the power 4. And then there will be some sine square of the sky triangle. And this process, now, what you would uh, have to do, so this is the process that you would have. <clears throat> and so if you want to now to compute P, the total power, which will be given by some integral of E d lambda, where this would be the total energy that we computed. So this is so scales like E to the B over lambda to the B. And we integrate this from zero up to some lambda. So this would give me a result that would be B times something that is approximately equal to 1, that I can write here explicitly. It would be 1 over 1 plus B from the integration. E, e to the B gives 1 over e, B plus 1. There was this factor B of B, but we said this B is close to 1. B is close to 0, so all this is 1. We don't care. And then lambda, because we integrate up to lambda. The energy, some energy scale. And then gamma for this hard process where we scatter these two to two particles. And that would be this P, the approximation to P. And so P will be basically this B times this stuff, where B is given by this formula. And therefore, the total power for the sun, for this process in the sun, would be what? Let's make an order of estimate, an estimate of the order of magnitude. It would be something like, we would have to consider there would be some g newton, some mu squared. We have to multiply this process by what? By the density of particles that collide. 
the density of the first type of particle, density of the second type of particle, and one could be density of electrons, and two could be whatever they collide with, electrons plus protons. Also, the flux of one with respect to the other, remember how we do it, we can say, let the electrons be static, and there's a flux coming through, so times an extra factor of velocity, V. The V combined with this V to the 4, so this will be V to the power 1 plus 4, so V to the power 5. And then uh, there will be some integral over the angle of sine squared of theta times whatever is the absorption cross-section for this hard process, the angular part that we will compute at some given energy for the integral over that gamma there to compute the total power coming out. And now what Weinberg did is just put numbers. What's the density of the light? Ah, and this is the density, density, the flux, the factor of velocity, and of course the volume of the sun. And the lambda that I forgot. And so now you just put numbers in all this, and that's where he concludes that this is roughly the power that a city like Berkeley uh, will uh, generate just plugging uh, some energy. The velocity is related to the temperature of the sun, the velocity of the particles. This uh, cross-section you can also estimate from some nuclear reactions. And you estimate everything, and you get something like that. And uh, that's an application. And just Googling, I saw that there was some activity around 2008 or something related to this prediction, but I don't know what was made, what happened about it. Okay, so this was the discussion of the paper. You guys had read the paper, did you think I was too slow? Was it a good pace, too fast? Was good? Okay, but you see it, it helps if you read the paper, right? That we can refer to formulas and uh, so if you somehow did not read the paper, maybe it's a good idea to read the paper for next time. So now we can discuss a few numbers. Okay, so, so very, first very basic thing, can this Friday be at 10 a.m. instead of 10.30? Is it bad for anyone? No? because I have a very strict cutoff at 12 and just in case we go over time, I just want to be safe. Okay, so thing number one, this Friday. Ten. Okay. Second thing about schedule is that the next three weeks I'm going to be traveling except for a few days, so we have two options. Either we take a break for three weeks, or we squeeze the two lectures in the four days that I'm around. So I'm around in the next three weeks. I'm around from Friday at 5 p.m. This is Friday, 29th of March, to Monday, say 9 p.m. Okay. So in this interval, I don't care, I mean, any time, night, morning, Sunday, whatever, we could fit two lectures here. And then otherwise, I'm back April, uh, well, this is Friday, and then there's a week of April, after April 7, maybe I'm back, I think April 8. So the week after April 8, we go on normally. So there are three weeks until uh, April 8. So either we put two lectures here, that could be one at Friday at 5, and one Monday anytime you want, for example. But if you think Friday at 5 is too late, it could be Saturday morning, or it could be another time, or we could just do Monday and do only one lecture, for example, and not do the second lecture. And then we would find a way to catch up. So that's one, one thing we have discussed. This would be the Landau singularity reflection. 
And the second thing we have to discuss about lectures is a more regular schedule after April 8th, what's the schedule that works best for people. And then we have to discuss how to do grades, and I have two ideas that I would like to discuss with you. But let's first, what we want to discuss first, one, two, or three. Maybe depending on three, you want to run away from the course. And <laughs> there's no point in discussing the schedule. So I don't know. If you want to start with uh, the last one, or uh, people that have schedule constraints, say something. So, so Leandro, yeah. you could not meet Tuesday. My only problem is on Tuesday morning. And what is what does Tuesday morning mean? All the morning or uh, all the morning. Okay. I see, I see. So you are in Uspi? Uh, uh, and you are interested in continuing to do... Uh, okay, very good. Um, so, Monday some people could not do, right? Monday morning was not good for some people. For you, any time on Monday morning. Again, and you are also you also will continue to do the course. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> okay, very good. Um, Three, good or so ten thirty Monday would be okay. Uh, On Monday you have ADS CFT. Okay. Um, and Tuesday. Uh, your advisor can only do Tuesday. I can come after lunch. Okay. But your advisor cannot do Tuesday uh, another day, any other day. For me, he can do Tuesday. Okay. He cannot, you cannot switch with someone else? Yeah, because everybody has its own schedule. Okay. What uh, the time do you suggest today? What day do you suggest? What time do you suggest? I well, suggest that Tuesday, Tuesday, uh, 1.30 p.m.? Yes. Tuesday, 1.30 p.m., is it equally good for everyone? Yeah? Okay, so, so we do Tuesdays, 1.30 p.m., and Friday, Friday, do people prefer 10.30 or 10? 10. 10? 10. 10? Okay, so Friday, 10 a.m. Good. So that was good. Now, this April, this March 29, to, uh, and this is, I think, is April, First, I think. Uh, to April first. Would you guys like to have two lectures or one lecture here, just so we don't uh, miss three full weeks, or do you prefer to miss full three weeks? And, and that's that's also fine. I mean, we just need seven more weeks, and we have seven more weeks. We can either jump, or we can try to put the one down here. If we put one down here, there's more chance that at the end of the course we can do one more paper. If we don't, the, the chance is smaller, but who cares? It's not a big deal. So I'm happy to come here uh, at 5 p.m. if people want. Yeah. Is this good? Yeah. Everyone? Okay, so we do Friday 5 p.m. And uh, what about uh, Monday? Ah, Monday there is ADS CFT. At what time? 10 a.m. 10 a.m. from 10 to? To 12? It's 2 hours? From 10 to 12. Okay. Would you like uh, to do Monday 1.30 p.m.? Okay, so Monday 1.30 p.m. Then we do the discussion. Okay, so this will be the special, so Landau, 
will be in this special uh, schedule, and I will put it on Google Classroom. Does everyone have access to Google Classroom? Can you write an email to Gastan asking to have access to Google Classroom? Because I already, in your case, I already did, but I think he didn't tell you. So ask Gastan, and he was up. Okay, last topic, grades. So my two suggestions are the following. One is, what could be this discussion on Friday? This discussion on Friday could be four 20-minute presentations. So that would be one hour and 20 minutes where each person would give a presentation aiming at 10 minutes, but 10 minutes often becomes 15, but you aim at 10 with five minutes of questions. So there would be one idea for this grade is the problem. So there are four presentations every Friday. Uh, 10 minutes plus five of questions. Of course, in practice, it's expanded, as we know. But uh, that would be the goal. And then, uh, based on these uh, presentations, uh, we could discuss in more detail how to grade these presentations. We could all vote, for example. <laughs> and, uh, create some doodles and, and vote, and uh, that's it. And I would probably separate this grade of this presentation in the physics. That would be 50%. The presentation, whether it was well prepared or whether it was idealistic and it would never fit in 10 minutes and, and so on. And the ability to answer questions and uh, how well the questions handled and so on. And that would be 25%. And we could vote. And we could just uh, vote on uh, everyone would vote and, uh, uh, and, uh, and that would, would be an idea. And we would randomly select the people that were present on Friday. So everyone has to prepare. If you are not called, you are not called. And we would be such that we don't repeat people. And so in practice, this means that everyone would present more than three times. Because four times eight is more than... Ah, I don't know. How many are we? One, two, three. Who is taking breaks? Who is uh, taking this for breaks? So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. The other ones are just uh, assisting but not doing progress. Can we check again? Let me check again if it's eight. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So then each person would have uh, three presentations, more than three, right? Eight times with four. Well, then we'll even need only three presentations to make it uh, three per person. But let's do four just in case, uh, because some days we will only be able to do three because we'll go over time. So. Then each person would have three presentations, so three grades, and we will drop the lowest one. And we will average the other two. Yeah, so that's method one. So we have three presentations per person, and we take the two best. Okay. And each Friday we will run the math. Okay, the problem with this method, so again, what would you present? The idea is to check the papers, the recent papers that cited it, find some papers that, oh, there was this nice application, I just explain in 10 minutes what was the main idea, or what is the main formula that was achieved, what was done, and, or there is some newspaper article that revived this uh, gravitational stuff from the sun, describe a little bit what it was about, and so on. Pick something. Now, what would be a danger is that you pick something that someone else already, already picked, and you both want to present the same thing, and then uh, you score very bad, because they, and then you have to prepare two things always, but you don't even know if you can present. So now there are many ways to solve that. You could uh, post on Google Classroom what you are thinking of presenting, so that people don't do the same thing, or you could create a WhatsApp group between yourselves and do it. Uh, you could think of ways to make sure that this doesn't become an issue during the presentation that you are both not covering the same newspaper that decided to study this gravitational stuff from the sun. Okay. Do, that's it. That's one idea. The other idea is two exams. And I would still suggest that we do the presentation stuff. We could still do the voting if you want for fun so that you improve and you say what you should improve. But this will not be graded. And I will do one exam after four one exam based on this, it could be 
I could ask, uh, I don't know, to start with this formula and compute this and uh, derive this from this or something like that. If you understood the paper, it would be some algebra stuff or uh, some conceptual point of the paper. And I would do two exams, one about the first four papers, one about the last four papers. Or, I mean, sure both, but uh, that's a bit too much. So, what do you prefer? Everyone prefers the presentations? Okay, and you like the idea of the split and the... So next Friday, what we will do, this Friday, at 10 a.m., I will bring the computer, I will put the names of the eight people. Then only the people that are taking for grade will do the presentation. And I will put the name of these eight people, the random sample three, and this will be the three, the random sample four, and this will be the four people that will present. Ah, but then there is a slight disadvantage, which is that it's, we said it's eight people, right? Okay, then what we can do, because then the next Friday, people, the four that will present already know who they are, but the first four don't. That's not very nice. So I can randomly select now, and select four people now to present, and that's it. And then I suggest that you guys create a WhatsApp group so that you make sure that you don't present the same thing. And again, it's 20 minutes, so it's one hour, 20 minutes. If you go over time, you will suffer a lot. And uh, people should then penalize you with both. So really try to aim at 10 minutes plus questions. If you go 12, 13, 14, even 15, it's fine. But if you go 25 minutes, it's a disaster. OK. So. So let me start here. Give me your name. So Juan, right? Dennis. Dennis? Yeah. Okay. Dennis. Rodrigo. Uh, Egan. You also, right? Egan. João. No. No. Francisco. Francisco, that's right. Uh, Alan. Alan. It's with one L. A L. Leandro. Rodrigo. Rodrigo. Rodrigo as well? Yeah. Yeah. Rodrigo yeah. Aguiar. Okay, can you see the names? Can you read from that? And now we go random sample names take four. No, it's not random sample. I random choice. Right? Yeah, it's random choice. Sorry, a random. Oh. Ah, okay. Okay, so it's random sample. I did so. I will click shift enter. Can you see? Okay, so Leandro, Egan, Alan, and Dennis. Okay, we can also, let's see, are they ordered? Leandro, then Egan, which was before. So clearly no. So this is also a random order, so we can do this random order. So Leandro can be the first one to present at 10 a.m., then Egan, then Alan, and then Dennis. What do you want? I don't. Uh, I don't care. I don't like slides. I hate slides. So my grading will be lower based on slides. 
my my vote, but my vote was the only one vote. So. So the, the, the other four people will be doing Landau Singularities on uh, April 1st. Uh, so yeah, do whatever you want and uh, for the voting I will figure out, uh, you all have phones, right? With the uh, internet, so I sh there should be a doodle or something. Does someone know how to efficiently create a poll that we can go to a very easy link and uh, immediately vote in a very fast way that we don't lose too much time. Can someone not of these four be in charge of finding out how to do it? Okay, you can do it. Okay, so you will figure out the voting something fast that we can all vote very, very efficiently. Okay, so that's it. So on Fridays I'll be sitting and I'll be helping, guiding, asking questions, but uh, Students are on. Take over. And I think the Friday one, the last thing, we don't record. I think there's no point. It's more informal. Or do you want to record so that you watch later? Up to you. You prefer to record? Just to get everything on the card. Okay, why not? Okay. So we still record. Them. But then uh, you can decide later if you prefer to keep the link private or share if, if there is a massacre. Okay.
three slides. One about the, the motivation for this paper, one about the main formula, and one with a summary of which I'm not sure what are the famous slides after that. There is a product of NLZ times one page with so the, the exponents. Like why the is this paper related to what, what we are discussing? So you the purpose. One page with something nice about this paper. I think one page with uh, why do people care about this paper? Times some other powers. That's enough. Three slides, three minutes each. One is ten minutes. So then this is going to be. And then it should be right. If people then would ask questions about minus the formula or about the impact. So this is going to be like one F zero. I'm if you prepare, if you want to do that, but forget. Make sure that you can. Did you memorize the four people? You know, the four people. Or you can write them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Yeah, I suggest you guys create a group yes. and uh, you tell us. Yeah. I think I will pick this paper and just understand. Yeah. You think I understand things at the time? Just so I don't think you need to form it down for the rating you wanted to be the part of the ATD. Yeah, there's also the thing with Venice. Usually, Venice is your ATD. But if they plus, they mine, they don't know. 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 I'll say uh, from the of the plan. Okay. Oh. Oh. And that translates to really this. Yeah. yeah. Sorry? And that you translate really yeah. to really yeah. 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 Well, that works yeah.